I want you all to do something. Take a moment, close your eyes, and think about Africa. Open your eyes. I know why you had your eyes closed. You were thinking about your earliest childhood memory of the African safari, an Africa of poverty, hunger, and genocide, inexpensive and overly dramatic Nollywood movies, and Africa of unruly people and weak political systems. While most of these things are true, today I want to talk to you all about why African countries have so much but continue to have so little. My name is Fatima Tuwage, and the central question of my talk today is, why are resource-rich African countries like Nigeria underdeveloped? And I think we can understand Africa's underdevelopment through three key arguments. One, we can understand it by looking at how African countries are incorporated and continue to be incorporated into the global political economic system. Two, we can also look at the dynamics and practices of the colonial legacy and how it has such a history manifested in the post-colonial. And three, we can also look at the practices and policies that have been put in place by Bretton Woods institutions, specifically the International Monetary Fund, also known as the IMF. The first country that I'd like to talk about today is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In the 1800s, a man by Leopold II, the King of Belgium, a fine looking fellow he is, <laughs> conquered the region and constructed the Congo Free State. With the Industrial Revolution at its height, Leopold imagined the Congo as the space that would fuel the Belgium economy and mark international prestige on Belgium. During such a time period, raw materials such as rubber and ivory were also in great demand. Thus, Leopold institutionalized a colonial, a colonial regime which would coercively extract rubber and ivory from the Congo. In so doing, he created an army called the Force Publique. And the sole focus of the Force Publique was to go into, was to go into local Congolese villages and make sure that Congolese villagers fulfilled their rubber and ivory quotas. If villagers didn't, they were beaten, parts of their bodies were amputated, and they faced other forms of human rights atrocities. My point is that earlier on, the Congo was incorporated into the global political economic system in a very coercive and extractive manner, where the Congo solely functioned as the space to extract raw materials which would feed Western economies. The Congo became radically open and vulnerable to the global system as a whole. And as the African scholar Samina Amin argues, the Congo became marked as the periphery, while the West became marked as the center. Leopold's history did not die. Today, the Congo continues to be incorporated into the global political economic system in a similar extractive manner, where Congolese resources of diamond and bauxite are geared solely towards the global system, feed in Western markets, feed in Western corporations, and leaving behind a Congo suffering with a series of weak political systems, a Congo suffering with a populace that is denied of human rights, and a Congo suffering from human rights, from underdevelopment. The practices and dynamics of the colonial history also manifest into the post-colonial. Take a country like Nigeria, for example, one of the world's largest oil producers. There, during the Berlin Conference of 1884, all the Western powers came together. They sat down, they had a map of Africa in front of them, and they literally carved Africa up into colonies. In this process, arbitrary nation states were created. Nation states which cut across geographical spaces, nation states which cut across ethnic groups, and nation states which cut across people who have been at peace or at war with one another for years, for centuries and years. When the British Empire came into Nigeria, Nigeria had over a hundred ethnic groups. However, through the, through the British Empire's policy of ethnic politicization, Nigeria was constructed, it was carved into three dominant ethnic groups the House of Fulanis in the north, the Yoruba in the west, and the Igbo in the east. 
The British Empire used these three ethnic groups as their agents and their partners in the colonial regime, where these three groups were used to sustain the British Empire and were also used to sustain the British Empire's indirect rule. And it was these three groups who were able to breed the fruits of the colonial regime, where they, they were able to obtain a Western education, amongst other good necessities. And when Nigeria gained independence in 1960, Nigeria became a nation state that was arbitrarily constructed and a nation state which had ethnic politics. As history tells us in the Rwandan context, ethnic politicization during colonialism breeds ethnic violence in the post-colonial. Today, contemporary Nigeria is a petrol state where the three groups that the colonial regime constructed continue to have an iron grip on the Nigerian economy, politics, and the Nigerian social system. And oil wealth is only, oil wealth is dominated within these three groups. And the other ethnic minority groups that the British Empire marginalized, specifically the Ogoni and the Ijawa, oil wealth is not distributed to them. And the Ijawa and the Ogoni, they have resorted to violence to reclaim in their nation state. And Nigeria remains underdeveloped, and it remains a nation struggling with corruption and weak political systems. During the 1970s, with neoliberal capitalism on its being, just being born, and with the recent decolonization of most African and other, part, other developing countries, the International Monetary Fund, a Bretton Woods institution, also known as the IMF, created a policy called Structural Loan, Structural Adjustment Loan Policy. And these were basically loans with conditionalities where in order to receive, and many African countries received these loans, where in order to receive these loans, African countries had to cut back on their public service spending, such as education and health. And after decolonization, most African countries were either socialist or authoritarian, and it, they were doing pretty good as that. But structural adjustment made them radically privatize, radically capitalize their national economies. So what did this do? This left African countries in huge debt, this made African nat national economies devalue within the national a, a glo larger global system, and it also made their economies very weak within the larger global political economic system. The effects of structural adjustment is evident in the country of Zambia, one of the world's largest carpet producers. As the HDI statistics behind me suggest, because of structural adjustment, Zambia's infant mortality rate is extremely grotesque, where one in five Zambian children die by the age of five. And also, as the life expect expect expectancy rate shows, life expectancy rates has decreased, and so has the primary school enrollment, where Zambia's GDP rate has also been grotesquely low after the structural adjustment loans. And because structural adjustment loans also made Zambia Zambian, the Zambian government come back, cut back on government subsidies that farmers were received. This led to got Zambia's, Zambia's food security being greatly threatened. So you all might be wondering, okay, now what? How can Africa move away from this history of otherization and racial oppression into a state of development? Last summer, I conducted a research at the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And I met this guy named Charles Nguna. And Charles was a lawyer. And Charles told me, Fatu, Africa's destiny is in the hands of the Africans, primarily the African youths. As Charles insists, although Africa continues to be the site of charity and other forms of aid, Africa would only become developed when Africans take control of their own political, social, and economic systems, their own business. So you might be wondering, OK, but what can I, as an individual, do? Earlier, I asked you all to think about Africa. And I'm sure that a series of images conjured through your mind. Some which were true, some which were untrue, and some which were positive, and some which were negative. My point is that we have this idea, this myth of Africa. And we need to reinvent this idea, this notion that we have of Africa and realize that the attributes that we often associate with Africa are in fact historically constructed by hegemonic powers and are in fact arbitrary. 
After all, change only becomes possible once we are aware, once we question the way we think, and once we challenge the institutions that are put in place. Thank you.